have your own version of the eye care project or any other or any other project i care for us will mean what do we care about and i was to my students so we've already made a list i care about safety i care about children i care about um road road safety because we have a serious problem with driving in trinidad not so dr deloach um we care about what do we care about Yes, all the things that we care about and how we can represent that and show that we really do care. Will you join with us? Think about it, joining with us. Colleagues, I've almost brought myself to the end. There's only one thing that I have to do. I have to do in addition to thanking you all for your, for your time and your space. One thing, honor me, please, with a little bit of Carnival 2019. <laughs> Trinidad and Tobago. Remember, it's Fantastic Friday. And it stopped. There we go. <laughs> this is my song for 2019, y'all. And some of the images of Carnival, Carnival in Trinidad, 2019. Bless you all and thank you. message this morning was to I had I had a, a number of different things I was trying to do one was to show that some of the things that are happening here in the US uh, and in the Caribbean and in Africa and in Europe and in South America really have so much overlap that there isn't a lot of difference across the world that social problems human rights social justice mean the very same thing the contexts are different but treating people with respect treating people with dignity recognizing people's need help understanding experiences from the inside so that we can truly uh, act in people's best interests really comes from that basic understanding that we are all the same yet different at the same time and so what I wanted to try to do was to make those connections but also to say that social workers have a job to do our mission is one is we are the leveling play the, we, we are there to level the playing field we are there to ensure to keep systems honest and to keep people um, to keep people true to what is right um, and sometimes we are silenced because we are agents of the state we work in agencies where the resources are small the mandates the politicians get in our way and they for, and because of that we forget what our real mission is and so I wanted to remind us of that this morning and I also wanted to share how the university can in fact begin that process through student engagement and activism let me try that again. <laughs> how you doing today? I'm well, That's how good. Are you? Good morning. Good morning. Very good. So you'll find out that I am an individual that's from the South. I grew up here in Georgia, as a matter of fact, and went to school uh, east of here, a place called Irwinton, Georgia, that's in Wilkinson County, and that's where I, I basically got my foundation and where I grew up. The thing was always you need to basically let people know who you are and engage them. Now. Before I get started, I want to let you all know one thing. You have never been in a seminar like this before because I am not your average anything. All right? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I can show you better than I can tell you. But this is going to be like a talk show. And you see what I'm doing right now? Mm -hmm. I am going to be walking up and down these aisles while I am talking to you. And guess what? I am going to walk and be positioning myself and I'm going to talk to individuals as I am doing this. <laughs> and guess what I am going to request of you individuals that I am talking to? How are you doing, Dr. Brillis? Pleasure to meet you, sir. Yes. So guess what? You're going to see me walking around. It's not going to be your standard anything because there is something wrong with me and I want to see if any of you can pick up on it once I get into the presentation. But the first thing I want to do I want to show you all what I'm all about. 
hit it. This is the father-daughter dance at my daughter's wedding. You can close it out. Go to the, uh, the PowerPoint, please. Okay, so now, you know that I'm, I'm, I'm unique. I'm, 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 I'm the most, I'm, look, I'm about the stankest individual that you'd ever want to meet. Now, by that, I mean that I've never met anybody that I didn't like. I don't see color when I am going to introduce the people. I don't see gender. My whole life has been about me getting to know people. But, before I get started, I want to let you all know one thing. Next slide, please. This is me. This is me. Uh, May 11th, 1982, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. And I spent a grand total of 37 years in the military. United States Army. And I have traveled around the world quite a bit, as you can see. I was a fairly decent athlete, also had the opportunity to earn a scholarship in basketball as well as one in football, and I decided to take the basketball scholarship. And as you can see, my background is physics and math and master's in education, and somewhere along the line, my sister convinced me, you need to go after your PhD because you need to be in academia. I don't know what I was thinking when I said yes, <laughs> but I did it, and next slide, please. Okay. This is my military back, background, folks. As I said, 37 years. Married for 34 years to the same beautiful lady who is also a retired military person after 22 years. Two beautiful daughters. The individual that was in the film was my Jocelyn Brown. And uh, after I finish this, I got to show you a picture of my firstborn grandbaby. Because, you know, I, I can't go through this thing without showing you that baby picture. So I got to put that one up there. Nine deployments. Oh, hold on. Nine deployments to Iraq. Four to Iraq, two to Afghanistan, three operational deployments, and if I told you about those, I'd have to kill somebody in here right now, so I'm going to keep those to myself. 52 months of combat duty. My passion is cooking, and as you can see, these are some of the things that I have. These are accolades that I have accumulated, but guess what? Next slide, please. Freeze. There's something wrong with me. Now, audience, are you all ready to become engaged? Yes. Who do you think, who can tell me what they think one of my learning disabilities is right away? Come on now. You all, you, you all in academia, you all had that student in your class that couldn't sit still. ADHD. 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 <laughs> that, that's just one of them. <laughs> all right. Now, I'm going to give you a hint. What is the worst thing that could happen to an individual that teaches math? Dyslexia. Dyslexia. Dyslexia with what? Dyscalculia. Numbers. One of my students scored a 19 on an exam, and guess what I put down? 91. <laughs> However, my other student scored a 29, uh, no, a 92. Guess what I put down? <laughs> Who do you think was more upset? <laughs> okay, so ADHD. But the thing about ADHD, I didn't know I was ADHD. Because where I came from in the South, and for those of you that live in the South, and I'm talking about old school South now, I ain't talking about new school South, you children were heard, no, no children were seen and not heard. Get out of grown folks' business. That's right. All right, get your butt out the room because grown folks talk. All right, guess who was the skeptic and always had to ask a question? Guess how many times I got my butt toe up? But, why? And so I learned to control my ADHD through trial and error, okay? So now, here is something else that, the doc, that when I got, as I got older, we didn't have Prozac or Ritalin. So guess what? When I became an instructor, guess what one of the first things that I told my parents that had children that were ADHD? Don't give them the medication. I want them in the class. I want them functioning with the condition because the medicine made them zombies. So being a person that was ADHD, guess what? 
as an instructor, my goal was to help my students because I wanted to teach them according to their learning styles and whatever idiosyncrasies they had. Not according to the way that I learned because I came up in the industrial revolutionary school system. <laughs> Rows and columns, rows and columns. Everything was rows and columns. You have to sit there, you have to listen to the teacher, and da, 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 da. And so the teachers were just talking, it was just lecture, lecture. You all know what happens after about 10 minutes of that, right? Wah, 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 And the teachers think they're doing a great job. Oh, I'm fantastic. They're not asking questions. They must be understanding. Wrong answer. One of the biggest things that I'm going to talk to you about is this mindset that learning is about the instructor. It's not about the instructor, it's about the audience itself. In this case, everybody that's in here. But too often, many of our instructors teach the way that they themselves learn. And you'll find that that, that is definitely true the further you get up into the academic ladder. But that being said, hit it for me one more time. Uh-huh, one more, uh-huh, one more, uh-huh, uh-huh. Guess what? I also stutter. And I'm talking about... <laughs> How many of you all saw Harlem Nights? <laughs> you remember the champ? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. <laughs> Somebody go, 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 go get knocked, knocked out tonight. But guess what I did? To keep myself from talking, I did not like talking publicly, so guess what I did? I read. I read so ferociously, I mean anything and everything that was to read, I read. To show you how much I read, and my mom knew that I read, my brother had a stack of girly magazines in the house, and I was reading the magazines. My mom didn't get mad because she knew I was reading and not looking at the pictures. My brother got in trouble though. <laughs> But I didn't, because I was literally reading. And guess what I did in all that reading? I read about these places like Africa. I read about Europe. I read about these places that I can only imagine in my mind, and I kept asking myself, can I someday visit these places? And that was the vision that I had. I want to visit these places. I want to go to these places where I see these people. When I saw Carnival for the first time, it was just a picture. And then I asked myself, what would it be like to be there? So now, there is one more that I have. And you all probably know what it is. 54 months in a combat environment. I suffer from PTSD. Now I'm still trying to get the VA to confirm that I suffer from PTSD. But for me, let me show, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. See that right there? That is a result of PTSD. Now, do you know why I move around so much? My defense mechanism to prevent people from concentrating on this is to move. So if I'm moving, there's nothing standing still and you can't see it. Now, but the thing is, go ahead, sweetheart. That is the thing, so here's what, let's talk about our goals and objectives for this particular session, go ahead. All right, what is PTSD? I want to identify some of the characteristics of PTSD. Understand the impact of PTSD, but not just on the military, because guess what? We're only 1% of the total population of the United States. And 30% of us in the military have PTSD if we have been exposed. But guess what? You talked about an individual that had been exposed to interpersonal violence. That individual will have PTSD, because unlike the military, we have a mission that makes us push it to the back and we are trained to push it to the back or suppress it and continue on with the mission. But people in regular day life do not have that option. They go into this thing we call denial. It never happened. Or we don't talk about it as the, as the good doctor said. We don't discuss it because people do the Heisman on it. I can't talk about that. But I found that as a part of this process that I'm gonna talk about, Talking is therapeutic. This, 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 this situation right here is therapeutic for me because it allows me to pour information into you all about something that you're going to be dealing with as a social worker. You're going to come across a person that has PTSD. 
in the military. And guess what I want you to understand? I want you to understand how to deal with them because I am one of those individuals. And I'm gonna show you some characteristics of things that you should not do when dealing with these individuals, all right? Okay, so now, go ahead. So, what is, P right there. What is PTSD? Something shocking, something scary, a dangerous event. How many of y'all have ever been involved in an automobile accident? What was the worst thing that happened? The car flipped seven times. Okay. Anybody injured? Okay. How did it make you feel? Nervous. Nervous. Now, when you got back into a car, what was the what 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 did what did you feel like when you got back into the car again? Uh huh. All right. Listen to what she said. She said she kept looking and anticipating that it was going to happen again. Can I share with you something that happened to me? We were in Iraq, and we, I was basically responsible for convoy security. So from time to time, I would go out, me and my team. The scary part about it was they had this thing called IEDs, all right? It's basically improvised explosive devices. So this is when the insurgents got smart, and they started taking all these things that were utilized, and they would basically create a bomb and the bomb was usually ignited either by visual or they used this thing we call a phone. Now, technology was just getting into its thing, but guess what happened one time? We pulled up into a location, we stopped, we pulled security, me and my team, it was my vehicle, my team of about eight or nine individuals, we got out, we set up a secure perimeter, and guess what? We were there for about 10 minutes and then we got back into our vehicle and took off. 10 minutes later, I get a call from the engineers. The engineers said, hey sir. I said, yeah, what's up? They said, well, you had such and such a location about 10 minutes ago? I said, yeah, right. They said, I'm gonna send you a picture and I want you to take a look at it. So the place where we were, there was a pole right there side of the road. I didn't think it looked like a little two by six by four or whatever, but there was a trench that went under it across the road. So we were there right by. He sent me the picture and here's what the picture showed. It was an old Nokia cell phone embedded into the block. He took a picture of it and on the screen, guess what it said? Three missed calls. When they dug it up, there were 10, let me repeat this, 10 155 artillery rounds. Now, to let you all that don't understand, a 155 artillery round could probably take out a space as big as this room, one. There were 10 of them there and they were all hooked up to a wire. And guess what? It was supposed to be triggered by the phone call. And I must tell you right now, if I never believed in God, I had my wake up moment at that time because God showed me then that he had me protected because whoever was doing this, I could see them up there going, ooh, why does it not work? Why does it not work? But guess what? We were protected. But guess what? It also left a mark on me because I started thinking what would have happened if that thing had gone off. And I've got to tell you right now, I'm a family man. I had my wife, I had my two daughters, and my, in my mind I'm going, what would have happened, Lord, if that had actually gone off? They wouldn't have been able to recognize my body because it would have been blown to shreds. The individuals in question, 10 other of my soldiers would have also had the same experience. So you've got 11 families that are impacted by something that we could not control in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So you push it back. Fast forward, I came back home, we were in the commissary. Guess what happened to me? Had an anxiety attack. Now the unique thing about it is, guess, guess what was so bad about the, what's your name, sweetheart? And Keitha, guess what was so bad about the anxiety attack? I'm in the, a commissary. There's nothing in here but people. But guess what? Subconsciously, guess what came to mind? What happens if something goes off? Where is the exit? How do, I, I need to know where the exit is. How do I get my family out of here? How do I get up? I'm, this is my mind now. I'm running. How do I get other people out of here? And it became so bad to me. My wife said, what's the matter? Because my hands start doing this. She said, what's the matter? I said, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. She said, what's the matter? I said, I got to get out of here. 
And she, I said, wait, I said, I said wait, 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 I said, wait, I said, where's the exit? She pointed to me. So guess what I did? I went over and I did this. I walked around the one outside first and then I walked over and I said, okay, here's exit one. There's exit two. There's another exit there. There's another exit there. Okay, got it. If something goes down, I'll get this group over here, tell somebody, take that group, I want you to go out that building. Something happens here, take this group, I want you to go out that exit. And I kept breaking it down and I had a plan in my mind. Guess what happened if I had the plan? Feng Shui. <laughs> Calm came over me because guess what? Now I know if something occurs, I've taken the necessary precautions to deal with it and exit it, okay? But guess what? That was just one incident. You all want to hear about the other one where I got in trouble with, with the law enforcement? Okay. What's the fastest most of you all have ever driven a car? 90? 90. 90? Close. <laughs> what else? Anybody else? Anybody ever drive fast, faster than that? Okay, here we are coming up I-95 North, coming out of Richmond, Virginia. And I got to tell you, in the military, they do some strange things. They train us on how to deal with certain information. If a vehicle pulls up behind me and I don't recognize the vehicle, I am to take evasive actions. Evasive actions mean speeding up, going right, going left, going right, going left, until I separate myself from the vehicle. Guess what happened to me on the morning of April the 5th? An unmarked police car. State trooper pulled up behind me. <laughs> And he was just pulling up behind me. But guess what happened to me? I don't know who this is behind me. They're too close. Escape and evade. I took off. I went right. I went left. I went right. I went left. And I kept going. Went up the road probably about eight miles. And the car pulled up behind me and the lights were on. I said, oh, it's a police car. <laughs> Must not be after somebody ahead. But he pulled up behind me, right? I pulled over. And guess what, Doc? Guess, guess what the cop said? He said, good morning, sir. I said, how you doing? <laughs> he said, I was behind you back there. I said, that was you? He said, yeah. And I said, he said, but, he said, you pulled off so fast. He said, what's the hurry? I said, look, I just got back from Iraq. I said, I've only been back about two weeks. I've got a briefing at the Pentagon, and I'm heading up there. And so if that was you behind me, it was an unmarked car, so I automatically went into survival mode. Now, here's the unique part. I asked this question, I don't even know why I asked it. I said, uh, how fast was I going? <laughs> he said, well, sir, I was doing 103. <laughs> and you were pulling away from me. <laughs> so, <laughs> knowing then the Virginia law states, if you're going anything over 80, it's called reckless driving. So he said, but, because your demeanor is so nice, he said, I'm just going to give you the ticket. <laughs> he said, you have to show up in court. We went to court, and the judge told me this. He, I mean, it was like had about 10 of us in the room, and it was the most amazing part was this. The judge looked at all the individuals. He's got a lot of military folks in here. <laughs> and, I, and I got funny, right? I went, yeah, judge, we all just got back from Iraq, and that's why we're all, <laughs> we're all in here. But the officer came up. The judge asked me, he said, what was his demeanor like? Was he cooperative? The doctor said, yeah. The judge said, here, sir. He said, Colonel Davis, here's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to reduce your ticket to speeding. This is God now. <laughs> I'm going to reduce your ticket to speeding, and I'm going to have you give you a fine, $45. And he says, I want you to go online and take a defensive course, which is $55. And he says, so that'll be your fine, $100. Which do you think, I've, uh, which do you think was more accommodating to me? I paid the hundred dollars. Not a problem. But that's just something to show you about how this thing is about PTSD. And take a look at these numbers. Seven out of eight people, out of every 100 people will experience a PTSD event. But we only associate it with military. An individual growing up in an abusive child abuse. An individual watching mom or dad being abused as a child. The historical aspect of that as well comes into play because guess what? When I talk to people about generational curses, generational curses are nothing but a product of this right here. Well, you know, that's, that's family business. We don't want to talk about that. But if you don't talk about it, guess what? Then you see why all these individuals that are walking around that are so jacked up. 
because they've never had to deal with the incident. They've never had anybody to talk to. That's why one of the things that I never do in my conversation, when somebody has a relative that passes or a loved one that passes, I never go up to them and go, how you feel? To me, that's the dumbest question you could ask anybody. How do you feel? And then, I don't know if you all saw this, you all remember, I think uh, about uh, five, six months ago, there was a reporter that got chewed out uh, when they had the uh, flood in North Carolina. This lady was literally struggling to keep her children, three children above water for like a day and a half. And so they get them into the shelter and guess what the reporter walks up to the lady and asks? How do you feel? <laughs> the lady went off. <laughs> And it's on film, she said, how in the hell do you think I feel? I've been rescued, I've been without food or water for almost 72 hours, and, and doctor, that goes back to you about the media and what the media does. The media is not interested in what you're going through, the media is interested in selling soap. That's their goal. And guess what, the more controversial it is, the more people that are watch, hence the, uh, the sponsors benefit. And you ever seen how the media gets up there and they go, thanks Bill, now back to this. I thought you were so concerned about what was going on. But look here, let's take a look at this, go ahead. And look at that one, women, you all are more likely to develop PTSD than men. You all know why that is? Men are hunters. Our stuff is straightforward. Give me the mission, let me do it. And look here, how many men have been told, suck it up? <laughs> Boys don't cry. Guess what? We've taken ownership of that. But guess what? At the same time though, ladies, you all are supposed to be compassionate. You all take stuff in and you all have all this compassion and guess what? That compassion leads to some of the things that you all have been exposed to. Hence, you are more likely to develop PTSD than, our, than the male counterparts. Next slide, please. These are the symptoms that they tell me I'm supposed to have. This is the theory. And for me, to be, to, for me to be diagnosed, I'm supposed to have, look at this, I'm supposed to have the following at least one month. So that means that I'm supposed to have at least one re-experiencing symptoms. Who makes that call? I'm supposed to have one avoidance symptoms. What's an avoidance symptom? Who makes that call? At least two arousal or react, in other words, that's like reflection, it comes back, it comes back. And then at least two cognition or mood symptoms. Now, the cognition and the mood things, look at my personality. I'm upbeat, I'm jovial. This is what my kids are used to seeing. I got a dark side though. You all want to know what the dark side is? When I get crazy, my dark side is this. Push me to the point of me getting sick and tired of hearing what you've got to say and I have a real dark side. It is so dark that I, I really work to prevent it from coming out because I really don't think anybody can deal with it. Because I don't care what you are, that's the primal part of me that comes out and is kill or be killed. I'm just being honest with you. That's how, that's how traumatic it is that I do this. So guess what I don't want to come out? That side. And I work very hard to maintain a certain level of things that I do to prevent that from happening. One of the things the doctors told me to do is don't hold stuff in. Talk about it. It's talk and, therapy. and guess what I learned to do? I learned to cook. Matter of fact, not just learn to cook. I can burn, y'all. I mean, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about slap your mama in the face good. And so for me, those are things that I do to help myself get to that point. But I want to go a little bit further. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm not going to read this to you. Take a, look at, take, take, take a look at this and tell me if anybody in here has ever experienced some of these things that we're looking at up here. Now, take a look over there at the statistics. 70% of adults in the U.S., 70%, 323 million people, 
223 out of the 300 plus million people have experienced something related to PTSD. 20% go on to develop PTSD. 8% of Americans have PTSD at any given time. And the thing is that some of you all have PTSD and don't even know it. All right, next slide please. One more. Okay, here's a go. Women are more likely than men. Genes may make some people likely to develop PTSD. And let me share something with you. I grew up in the South. As a matter of fact, I grew up in the segregated South. So I remember the Ku Klux Klan. I remember cross burnings. My dad had it worse than I did because he grew up before then. But you know one thing my dad taught me? He says, you can either define what you're going to be or you can let somebody else define what you're going to be. Why do you think they call it self-esteem? It's what you think about you, not what somebody else thinks. But in Bloom's taxonomy, for those of you that are familiar with, Bloom's taxonomy tells us that there are certain levels and things that have to take place. Do you like you? What's your name, sweetheart? Lucy. Lucy, do you like you? Do you love you? Do you love yourself better than you love yourself? Guess what? As Michael Jackson said, the only person that can stop you from being what Lucy wants to be is Lucy. Now, what I want to share with you is this. Surround yourself with people that think positive like you. How many of you all take advice from a joker that ain't never had a dime in his life, but he or she wants to give you advice about how to save money? <laughs> how many of you have been around an individual or person that I call negative transference? You all know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, my life is so lousy. Oh, the world is going to an end. How you doing today? Well, you know, my scoliosis is acting up. You know, my knees hurt. You know, my husband left me. My children aren't acting right. And by the time you finish, what happens? You feel worse than they, you, you feel worse than, than when, do you have to come? And then you start doing, it, it's almost like, it's, <laughs> excuse me, Lord. It's almost like, was, how do you all remember when the Jehovah Witnesses used to come around and folks used to be cutting the windows, shut, shut the door, shut the door, shut the door. It becomes almost like that from time to time. But here's the thing though. I want you to look at these factors that play a part in whether you will develop PTSD. Alright? That word, resilience. How many of you all think you're resilient? I mean, I only got one, per one, two, three. I mean, only three or four, five. Okay. No, don't raise your hand now because everybody else, oh, he, oh, he going to put somebody on the spot. No, don't raise your hand now. Look, if you were, if you were resilient and you believed that you were resilient. <laughs> so, who, who's that? What was that? Cancer. Say it again. Cancer. You better go ahead, girl. Look here. Here's the thing I want you all to understand. Resilience is not something that can be taught. Resilience is something that you learn from the people that you hang out with. This is, this is a philosophy. It's hard to hang out to fly with eagles when you're hanging out with turkeys. How many of y'all hang out with turkeys? All right, how many PhD candidates are, do I, do I, how many PhD people do I have in the, in the audience right now? All right, I got one, two, three. You know who I want to hang out with? I want to hang out with y'all. Because y'all have gone through the PhD process and I want to pick your brain because sometimes I get to the effort factor. No. <laughs> it ain't to forget it, but I'm going to use that. <laughs> because the bottom line is it is so demanding. But guess what? I don't quit. You knock me down, I'm going to get up. If I get knocked down seven times, I get up eight. I'm going to be like that goat in the well. I'm going to brush myself off, shake it off. Stuff it under my foot and guess what I'm going to do then? By the time you realize that well that I was in has been filled with dirt and I can step out of that hole that has been placed before me with style and with vigor. That's the way I want you all to be. And guess what? Age ain't got nothing to do with it. If you sit up there and assume just because I'm older, somehow I'm no longer important, wrong. The best conversations I've ever had, everywhere I've went, have been with older people. When I was in Afghanistan, 
I met a gentleman that was 103 years old. Through translators, I, I, I basically talked to him. And guess what his philosophy of life was? Live life one day at a time. Love everybody you can. Do for as many people as you can for as long as you can while you can. And guess what? At the end of my emails, that's the philosophy that I use about leadership. Here's the other thing. Went to Japan. I'm thinking, okay, here's Japan. Guess what amazed me about Japan? 90-year-old men and women riding bikes. And I, uh-uh, no, I'm not talking about just... <laughs> I'm talking about riding the bikes. They're out there doing Tai Chi with their groups. They're out there dancing and they're out there singing. But they don't look old. They're doing life and they're doing life together. You know what we do here in the United States with our elderly? We put them in a, we put them in a home and we tell them, you too old for that. I will never ever tell an elderly person, you, Dr. Wager, 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 you're never too old. As a matter of fact, you're like fine wine. We get better with time. And look here, you see that individual that was up there dancing? That was a 61-year-old man that you were talking about. Now ask me, do I act my age? I embarrass my daughter sometimes, but that's okay. So here's the thing. I want you all to understand that with this thing called PTSD and this thing called resilience, Every place that I've ever been, that's been the thing that I want to pour into everybody. I went down to Central America. Guess what I talked to the young people about? Resilience. I went to China. Guess what I talked to the young people and the elderly folks about? Resilience. In Afghanistan, I talked to them about resilience. And guess what? It has really given me a new insight when, you heard, when I heard the doctor talk about globalization. You know what I love about globalization? We find out that we have more things in common than there are differences. And then guess what? With this thing that we call the, the, the human technology, this right here, this allows you and me to share every, our thoughts with others around the world and we see that they are talking about the same thing. She talked about Tobago Trinidad. Every picture she showed me, I went DC, Baltimore, the riots. Los Angeles. Everything that she showed, I have seen it and I have worked, I have lived it in some way, shape, form, or fashion. When I looked up and saw something, when she showed the, the floods, Katrina. You know how I know Katrina? Because in the military, my organization was responsible for getting people out of those areas that you saw. Here is some of the stuff that we saw in Katrina. Caskets floating down. And I'm not talking about one or two caskets. I'm talking about six, seven, eight, nine, ten caskets floating in the water. And my team and my guys had to go out and collect that. I'm talking about people being stuck on a bridge and we have to go out there and get them. But then the downside was bodies. Have to go out and get them. And yes, we had to push it. The humanity couldn't come out because we had to push it to the back because there was a mission to be done. Now I'm going to share with you the worst one that I ever had. Desert Storm. There was something called Hell's Highway. For those of you that are not familiar with Hell's Highway, that was a road or a highway coming out of Kuwait that the Iraqis used to try to get out of Kuwait before the Americans and all the other uh, allies moved in. Well, in that process of them moving out, guess what happened? They were led by an armor unit. These are called tanks and, and uh, uh, armored personnel carriers and then other vehicles and they will basically follow. But guess what they did before they came into Kuwait? They mined the highway on both sides with anti-personnel and anti-vehicle mines and forgot that they had mined them. So when the military, our military showed up in what we call our Black Hawks and our Cobra helicopters, we fired on the front vehicles and basically we, those front vehicles blocked the highway so everybody started going off to the right. The chaos and the carnage that basically ensued, ensued was horrendous. My personal story. We walked in. We were responsible for uh, mortuary affairs, cleanup. 
Now, and I, I know this is graphic, but I still have to share it with you. The strangest thing that I saw was a pair of boots cut off at the legs. Boots still there, feet still in the boots. Individuals beheaded, bodies ripped apart, and we have to basically go in and clean this up. It was called Hell's Highway for a reason. That leaves, that leaves an indelible effect on you as a person. And you ask yourself, how am I gonna deal with this? How am I gonna get through life dealing with this trauma? That's where the resilience come in. Now, I could sit there and suffer, or I can sit there and ask myself, why did it have to happen to me? But I'm a firm believer that God does things for a person, for a reason. And next slide, please. So guess what? You ever ask yourself the question, why is it that you go through some of the things that you go through? Here's my, this is, this is Dr. Davis's theory. What you're going through is not for you. Y'all hear what I just said? What you go through is not for you. You as a social worker, what you've dealt through in your lifetime should enhance your desire to be a social worker because it preps you to be ready to deal with the persons that you may have to interact with as a part of being a social worker. So, give me a perfect example. I don't drink, I've never done drugs, so would I be a good advocate for drug rehabilitation? Why not? I ain't got no street cred. <laughs> Literally, think about it. How can I tell somebody about being on drugs? I got drunk once in my lifetime, but that was for national security reasons. But how can I, as an individual, be a valid advocate to anybody that I'm trying to help if I don't know what they're going through? Social workers, she alluded to it. Know your audience. Know your audience, know who you're dealing with. And for you to do that, you have really got to do your homework. If it's drug intervention, know what drug intervention is. Know what the, know what the characteristics of drug intervention is. Know what therapies that are available. That is your job as a social worker to be able to do that. And guess what? Here's the thing I want to tell you. You all have been gifted with something. And this is from God now. God put it in you. But the question is, do you recognize that you have it? So here's my question to everybody in here. Do you possess the gifts and the talents needed to complement your quest as a social worker? Absolutely. You said, sure, what, is your, what are your gifts? Um, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Go ahead, I'll just mess with you. What are your gifts? Uh-oh, you said, I don't know. Communicating skills. Huh? Oh, okay. Communication skills, is that, is that a good gift to have for a social worker? Yeah. All right, yeah. I'll accept that. <laughs> How about you? I want you all to think about this because guess what? This is one of the things that I tell people all the time. How many of you all go into social work because you think it's gonna be a job for you? Guess what I call a job, folks? Just over broke. <laughs> how, many, how many people go into a job just because they're not sure exactly what it is they want to do. And you all have seen them all the time. How many of y'all ever go into a fast food restaurant, you go in there, the individual at the counter got attitude because they are upset by their choices in life and they don't, they didn't want, they don't really want to be there but they got bills to pay, so guess what happens? Just over broke. And then they get mad at you and you go, well baby girl, I didn't ask you to make that decision about what you did with your life. You had the same opportunities that I had. United States of America, free, free education. All you gotta do is show up. The teacher don't like me. The teacher prejudice. Well, what about you? What are you doing? That's the question. In spite of all those obstacles, and look, racism, prejudice, bigotry. Is it anything new? Let me go on my spiritual side for you now because I'm also an ordained minister. There is nothing new under the sun. 
You know what, the only difference between everything that's happening right now, and I love the millennials because they go, protest, protest, protest. And I'm going, you know what, the only difference between what you all are dealing with is the ability to communicate it to the global world now. That's what this does for you. But here's the question that I pose to you as we look at that. When we look at the globalization of it, what does it do about the justice aspect of it? Freddie Gray up there in Baltimore. How many of the individuals have been indicted and convicted? And he's just one. And here's the other part. You see them show it on TV. The film is right there. And they say, I feared for my life. Really? He was running away. She was running away. So how is it that you fear for your life? This is the stuff that I'm talking about. Abilities to look and see. Now, as I talk about this, exposure therapy, cognitive reconstruction. How many of y'all understand what that word means? Cognitive. Well, but you're an instructor. I know you're going to know what it means. <laughs> I want some of these young folks up here. How many of you young people know what cognitive reconstruction means? In other words, oh, that sounds like it's biblical. What does the Bible say? Let there be a renewing of the mind <laughs> so that you may recognize the so guess what cognitive restructuring means the way that you think all right how many folks have you seen it's all about me 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 ne never taking responsibility for the action so the cognitive reconstruction tells you to look at it from another person's perspective step back and look at the big picture. Do you know what? That's why you all as social workers get such a bad rap. Because people want you to look at it just from their perspective. Why don't you understand? I'm the victim. I got you. <laughs> but there's a bigger picture. And the question then becomes, how do I help you? Or how do you help me help you? That's a part of that cognitive reconstruction. All right? Look at what it says. I like the bottom part there. Focus on changing how people react to their PTSD symptoms. Face the trauma. That's the most amazing thing that I tell people. Don't run away from your problems. Embrace the problem. And once you embrace the problems, you come up with solutions that will help you basically deal with the problem. All right? Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to be very honest with you. I'm hurt. Can you all ask why I'm hurt? Can you all ask why I'm hurt? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I am hurt because I look here and I see a lot of ladies and I see very few men. Okay, no, no, and here's the thing. When we talk about globalization, it's not an individual effort, it's a global effort. Both men and women both straight and gay, both old and new, millennials and old school, baby boomers, Generation X. For us to solve this world's problem, we have, got quit, we have got to quit looking at it from our perspective and look at it from the perspective of everybody involved. Then we can have the dialogue about what needs to be done. I am a firm believer in the team concept. Is there an I in team? No, because guess what? You bring something to the table that I may not have. That makes you a valuable part of the team. Dr. Wager, you bring something to the table that I may not have. That makes you a valuable part of the team. The team is only as strong as its weakest link. That is a military standard and that is something that I tell people all the time. So when I'm dealing with crowds, I tell them, you bring the idea. You bring the ability to put the idea together. You come up with the creativity of how to take that idea and apply it to different situations. You're the individual that executes it from right and left and you tell what's gonna happen from point A to point B. There's communication back and forth between all four of you and the communication doesn't stop until the objective is reached. And then guess what we do then? We go to the, my dogs. <laughs> we go to the next one, all right? Next slide, please. Back it up one I want you to, all right. These are two models that I came up with. In my travels around the world, and when I started working on my PhD, 
my background and my, my focus of my PhD is called continuous process improvement. Now, what do I mean by continuous process improvement? If I told you to eat an elephant, to eat an elephant, how would you eat the elephant? Oh, I heard it, I heard it, I heard it. Who said it? One bite at a time. Skip, we got it right here. One bite at a time. One bite at a time. And guess what? One bite at a time, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. Guess what happens at some point? You're all done. Okay, guess what life is about? Continuous process improvement. And I can prove it to you. Somebody asked me, prove it to me. Prove it to me. Here we go then. Watch this. My mom and dad did not finish high school. My dad had to quit school in the sixth grade because he worked on a farm and he had to go out there and work on the farm. That was the case for a lot of individuals born in the 30s up through, I would dare say, even as late as the 60s. And even later on than that. But guess what happened? Guess what their philosophy was as it relates to their children? Come on, you all have the same philosophy? If, how, better yet, how many of y'all have children? Go ahead. My children will have better than what I had. I want my children to have better than I had. So I didn't finish high school, so guess what, I, guess what they wanted for us? They wanted us to at least finish high school. Now what we did with it after that, that was on us, okay? How many of y'all have school clothes? You got school, wait a minute, she, she raised her hand. <laughs> you got school clothes? Oh, wait a minute, no, no, I said, how many of you all have school clothes? And you went just like this. I, you didn't even hear the question, did you? You didn't even hear the question. You raised your hand before you even had a chance to hear the question, did you? Your children, I got you, sweetheart. Your children have school clothes. How many of you all, like me, remember the old adage of when you came home, you had to get out of your... School clothes. Can I, can I get a boom shakalaka? Just need a hand up. <laughs> wait a minute, you don't know about getting out of your school clothes. <laughs> how many of you all believe this young man? My parents are old school. <laughs> So you got school clothes, mm -hmm. ah. regular clothes. No, and regular clothes. Okay, so here's the thing though. When I grew up, and I'm gonna use this example, we were poor, yeah. not poor. Po. Po. No, we want P-O-O-R, P-O. Couldn't afford the other R, <laughs> or the R. <laughs> and we couldn't buy a vial, I'm just letting you know. Couldn't do it at all. <laughs> It was just that bad, but guess what? I didn't know it. I, it. It took me going to college to find out that I lived below the poverty line established by the United States government. It's called the gross national product or the individual income level and we did not make enough money to be considered poor. Okay, did poor. But guess what, I didn't know it. I ate well, whatever, and look, and here's the other thing I remember, in not just eating well, but guess what? I don't remember being hungry. Now fast forward to my own children. The hardest decision they ever had to make was not what they were gonna eat, but to choose what they were, just open up the pantry. <sighs> <laughs> open up the refrigerator. <sighs> Ain't nothing to eat, really? really? <laughs> Really? You mean I'm out here working my butt off day in and night and this, the pantry is stocked. But it ain't what I want. That's what you, say it again, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing to eat, right? So guess what? But here's the thing though. They planted a seed in me. And that seed basically grew into something else. Because the seed that they planted into me allowed me to go off to college and I'm gonna show you how this is all connected. Guess who was watching me go off to college? No, not the children, somebody that you all know very well that's right here in part of the social work department right now. Who is that individual? Dr. Irma Gibson. Now she's watching me go off to school, so guess what's in her mind? He ain't gonna beat me. <laughs> he ain't gonna... <laughs> Look, and I'm like, say what? He ain't gonna beat, this ain't a race, this ain't a fight. He's not gonna beat me, but guess what I realized? I realized then that everybody, somebody is watching you. 
guess where most learning takes place? It's not from what you say, it's what you do. All right, I'm gonna throw this out. I'm getting ready to go into a dangerous area now. All right, how many of y'all are married? Okay, when the children do something wrong, whose side, uh, who's, what, what side does the negativity come from? <laughs> when they're doing something wrong, who do you blame? Go ahead, you can say it. Look, I, I, I've experienced it. Oh, she get, my wife quit. Oh, she gets that from your side of the family. Really? Really, baby? <laughs> and guess what I'm telling her? Uh-uh. And then I start pointing it out to her. Your, your, your brother? <laughs> your uncle? No pookie <laughs> That's your side of the family. But that's the ongoing. But guess what? I realized that I was being watched. And so everything that I do, there are second and third order effects to it. Now, I want you all to understand how important that is, second and third order effects, which is why we have such injustice, because individuals don't look beyond what's right now. They don't look at the second and third order effects of status quo. They don't look at the second and third order effects of a young man being put into a prison at a young age or a young woman being put into a prison at a young age and being held in that environment. They don't look at the second and third order effects. That's one thing that I'm glad the military taught me is about understanding and realizing second and third order effects. That cognitive reconstruction that I was telling you about, that's second and third order effects. You've got to visualize that. So when you as a social worker, I'm telling you, you have to look and recognize what are the second and third order effects of what this individual is dealing with. Remember I said earlier about the generational curses? Mama had a baby at 15. Daughter had a baby at 14. She was a grandbaby at 45, or she was a grandmother at 45. Guess what that is? That's a generational curse. Mama was beat up. Daughter seems to attract the individual that, that beat up. And then the son is an individual that becomes one that does the Because that's their norm that they see. So the, recon, the cognitive reconstruction, we've got to break that cycle. And I like the way Dr. Martin Luther King said it. He said, where one is oppressed, we're all oppressed. Mm -hmm. Now, you may be able to go into your little, I call them the, the, your, your little white castle and close your door and say it goes away. But guess what? As soon as you walk out in the morning, it's there. And you do are impacted by it because they use your taxes and your tax dollars and everything else to make the, try to help these individuals. Okay? So now, let me tell you about these models here. Your role as social workers ex exists in exposing the extent of the disorder in society. Go ahead, sweetheart. Go ahead and bring them all up. I want you to go ahead and bring them all up. Right, right there. Hold right there. Now, the cave model is a model that I created. Now, can anybody describe to me, what's your name, sweetheart? Ira. Ira. Tell me what a cave looks like. A cave looks like... Um, Somebody keep me on time too. Go ahead. It's like um, you can get a you can get assistance on the person next to you. <laughs> it looks like um, an opening. It's an opening within the ground. Okay. And it has several sides, and you can go in it. Some are dark. Okay. Some have bags. Uh huh. Um, one way in, one way, in and one way out. Is there, one way is there out. much light in a cave? Hardly no light. Is it, is it sometimes damp? Oh, yes, it's always okay. damp. Okay, not the most appealing environment that you want to be in, right? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, sweetheart. Now, take a look at what I did. I took the cave and I said, let me create a model. Since my background is, my background is continuous process improvement, I said, I want to create a model that I can give to individuals that applies not just to the individual, but it applies to organizations as a whole. Because in continuous process improvement, guess what we do? We do an analysis of an organization and we come in and tell them where the gaps are and to help them improve their performance at the optimal level. But guess what? That is only, the organization is only as good as what they do for everybody that makes up that organization. If a supervisor is not looking at his people that he's supervising 
and making sure that they have the resources that they need, they have the training that they need, and they have this thing I call constructive and corrective feedback. Can anybody tell me what they think that is? Corru constructive and corrective feedback. Listening to the employee and then addressing it. Go ahead, Dr. White, one more time. Listening to the employee and then addressing his concerns. Okay, how many of us don't want to be told that we're doing a good job? What's your name, sweetheart? Nicole, how you doing? Nice you. Baby, you are a beautiful young lady. Thank you. I love the way that you do your hair. It's just so special. And the thing that I like about you is that you're smart, you're intelligent, and you can do anything you want to do. Now, if I tell you that every day, what are you going to start doing? Whatever you say, like being You're going to start acting like it. Versus me, versus me saying you're stupid, right. you're unintelligent, right. you're unimportant. Facts. Guess what? When we label young people in special ed, and we tell them they can't do this, we tell it to older people, you can't do this, guess what they're gonna start acting like? So corrective and constructive feedback is called reinforcement and encouragement. Yes, I may say some negative things, but I'm gonna start off with the positive, and if I give you a negative, guess what my first step should be? And you all call them IDPs, Individual Development Pairs how you can improve upon those areas. And when we meet, I'm not gonna talk about anything other than those areas that we talked about that we're developing. So the meeting doesn't take long at all. Now, take a look at the accountability piece. Anticipation. Well, I've talked about it and given you some assets, but be on time, prompt, and ready to start. How many of you all come in late? Do you make excuses when you're late? Okay. Guess what? Military. Any military folks that you have beside myself? Prior military? Okay. Here's the military mindset. If you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. <laughs> All right? So my thing has always been, even when I got here today, I got here about 30 minutes prior to because I wanted here to come in and check out the situation and make sure everything was functioning. Came in to check this out and look. Look at, look, at, look, at, look at the three there. Identify any potential problems or restraints. Assess all available resources. Plan for the worst case scenario. When you go into a social work environment, guess what I want you to do? Plan for the worst case scenario. When you plan for the worst case scenario and it doesn't happen, guess what? You've satisfied the problem. Temporarily, but now you've got to deal with the individual aspect of what does this person need, this case study or the case that I'm dealing with, the case worker, what do they need for me to get them to where they are somewhat whole? And that starts up here in the head. Get that mindset to thinking that they can do anything, but you have a role in this process. It's not just one side, excuse me, it's not just one side. You both, I have a role as the case person, you have a role as the patient. So together we work it out. Look at the verification place there. Verbally and identify all relevant players. I see almost 50 people in here. You're all relevant players. Some of you are in the learning mode, but you're also a teacher. How does the professor know what you don't know if you don't open up your mouth and ask a question? How many of you all are afraid to ask a question because you, are, you might think it, make me, it might make me look like I'm stupid? No. Because guess what? If it's 10 people in the classroom and you ask a question, nine of them had the same question. They were just afraid. What you laughing about? What's your name, sweetheart? Have you been in that situation? You haven't been in that situation. Well, I have. As an instructor, one of the first things that I like to do is walk into my students and I ask them this question. I teach math, by the way. What are you afraid of in math? That's the first question that comes out of my mind. I want to know what it is that you're afraid of. What is it about math that makes you afraid that you can't do it? Well, my mama wasn't good at math and my daddy wasn't good at math, so I'm not good at math. Wrong. One does not impact on the other. And so my first, my first role then is to tear down that wall that they put up about math. All right, and let me show you an example of how I did that. Seventh grade, I'm teaching students in math. Soon as I said algebra, 
They probably started hearing this. Wah, 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 Oh, he said algebra. I, I can't do it. So I took algebra out of the equation. I walked into the classroom. I put a problem on the board and said, let's work this. And I walked them through the process. Now, little did they know that they were using, that I was using a 10th grade algebra book. And I took them, after getting permission from the, the, the principal, I took them through that 10th grade algebra book in one semester. And at the end of it, I pulled the book out and showed it to them and I went, guess what you all have been doing? And I showed them the book. One of the students jumped up and said, that's my sister's book. She's in the 10th grade. <laughs> guess what? I found out that students are only as good as the expectations that you have for them. How much time I got? All right. The expectations that you have for them. And so you have to do this thing right here of looking at the resources to ensure that they meet the standards identified in your plan. Guess what? When they realized that they were capable of doing it, guess what happened to them? Motivation went up, self-esteem went up, everything went up, it changed in that classroom. And then here's the part right here, execution. Put your plan into action. Now, hit the next slide, because now I want to show you how that works in this one right here. And I'm done. Why do you think I said no more excuses? The maximum effective range of an excuse is zero meters. That's a military term. In other words, don't come to, as a matter of fact, how many of you all have classes today? Or any, anybody else got classes today? What time does your class start? How long have you known that? Has it changed at all? So here's the question. How can you be late then? Now, I understand that there are some moments, yes, but to be consistently late, that's a choice that you made. Let's talk about discovery a little bit. How many of you all know what your gifts, skills, and talents are? Can I ask your name, ma'am? Denise. Denise, what is your, what is your gift? Communication, listening, being attentive, and Go ahead, sweetheart. I just like the way you sound. Keep on talking. <laughs> Girl, you just validated what I just said. What I was just saying here. Now here's the unique thing about it, Denise. How do those gifts complement what you want to do as a social worker? This is everybody in here. How do your gifts that you have complement what you want to do as a social worker? Okay. Guess what? Empowered is the word I was looking for because I want to go back to something that the good doctor said. She said that too many of us fall in with the status quo and we run across that individual that said, you know what, girlfriend, this is the way we've been doing this for like 15 years now. And this is the way we're going to keep. You just get in line and guess what? You have lost your power and your authority to make change because you've fallen in line with the status quo. I want you to basically discover what your gifts are and I want you to use that to guide you in this vocation called social work that you've chosen. Look at that quote right there. When you utilize your gifts, skills, and talents, the effort to complete a task doesn't feel like work. It becomes something more than just a job. When I see lights pop on in individuals' heads, I know that my gifts and talents have not gone in vain because somebody got a little bit of what I was trying to say. Take a look at the design. Once you discover what your gifts and talents and skills are, then you need to come up with a plan, i.e., what is it that you're going to do to help develop that gift? How many of you all surround yourself with individuals that have the same gifts that you have? I'm going to go here. I'm going to go back here. And you, sir. Professor, I presume? Page. Page. I'm going to go right here. How many of you all pick the brains of these individuals? How many of you all just let her come in here and talk and talk and talk and then you don't come back and ask her some questions about, doctor, how did you get to where you are? Tell me what it is that you did to get to where you are and guess what, tell me some of the obstacles that you dealt with because guess what, the same obstacles that you're dealing with, she dealt with as well. But you never know, and the good doctor right here, you never know unless you ask the question. That's the problem I hate about millennials right now. You all are so into this right here. 
that the ability to communicate is gone. Mm, that's true. Mm. Ask you a question, you go, I don't know. <laughs> Ask Siri. Siri. Yeah. Siri. Mm -hmm. Siri. Yeah. yeah. What's the answer to this question right here? Know what Siri gonna tell you? I'm sorry, you need to talk to the professor. <laughs> <laughs> that's how this thing works, guys and gals. Take about the development piece. Now, what's so important about the development aspect of this thing? Development means put your plan into action. Don't go day by day saying, I'm going to do it haphazardly. Know what you're going to do every day, how it's going to play into the design of what you want to do, and how it's going to take your gifts and allow you to use those gifts to get to that level that you want to. Me? I'm only just beginning. Mm -hmm. All right. I have only just begun to do the right. stuff that I want to do. And when I say I want to do stuff on a global level, I am talking a vision. Mm -hmm. She talked about the uh, immigrants coming in. You know what I want to do? I want to set up a corporation where I get these immigrants and bring them in, give them a job, work to get them a green card, work to get them educated into the American system and make them productive citizens legally without having them to have to run and hide. Because as long as you got a job, as long as you got your green card, you okay. I'm going to have my lawyers in place. I'm going to have everything in place in terms of infrastructure that will allow them for, to me, the American dream is the American dream. And nobody here in America can call themselves an American because we're all immigrants. Mm -hmm. The only true American is the American Indian. Everybody else is an immigrant. So how are you going to deny one immigrant the same rights that you got? All right. <laughs> Common sense stuff. Watch this, even more so. I don't get mad when I see somebody being successful. That's that development piece. Guess what development, that's practice. How many of y'all have your elevator speech? Y'all don't even know what elevator speech is, do you? <laughs> Dr. Wagner, can you tell me about yourself in 30 seconds? No, sir. Give me, give, just do the best you can. Just give me a 30 second schmooze about you. Well, I was raised in a rural area. Mm -hmm. um, doc, father had PhD and MD. My mother was a master. Hello. Of work. Hello. And so I was always involved in academics. That's all I need, sir. You heard what he just said? Father and mother were involved, PhD, MS, and PhD. Guess what? He was always involved. That gives me an idea of where he came from. Guess what? Do you know who you're going to run into or who God's going to put in your path to help get you to where you need to go? All right. All right. But if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to be able to communicate that aspect? All right? Very important. Then here's the other part. How do you practice for your social work? Last one, deploy. Put your plan into action. That's all you have to do. Small increments, continuous improvements. And here's my last part. You can't deploy what you don't believe in. You can't deploy what you're not committed to. If you're not committed to it, it's not going to happen. The four Ds, discover, design, develop, deploy. Go ahead and take a picture. As a matter of fact, I'll make it available to my sister and then she can make it available to you as well. Next slide, I think that's it. Boom, question and answers. Come on, this is your chance. Now, and don't say you ain't got no questions because I know so, I've been seeing it popping up. Ooh, Lord, I need to ask him a question right now. All right, question and answer. Tell me what you want. Doom, 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 doom. Do, 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 do. Go ahead, my brother. You said you can cook. What's your best dish? What isn't my best dish? <laughs> no, I'm serious. You want a banana pudding? Okay. You want sweet potato pie? Uh, uh, you want fried rice, chicken, pork, or a combination thereof? Uh, you want sweet potato pie? You want fried rice, chicken, pork, or a combination thereof? Look here. I got something that I, I think I think I'd love to do, and I'm gonna try to do this for her. I've got this thing called spaghetti squash that I do. Squash. Yes. Take the squash, give out all the stuff that's inside, get me some oil, uh, some Goya seasoning and some olive oil, put it on top, put that into the oven for about an hour. When it comes out, the shreds look like spaghetti. I take that, I get myself about a pound and a half of shrimp, Goya seasoning and some olive oil, saute that, and then I use a marinara sauce of my own making, and I tell you what, green peppers, red peppers, sweet peppers on top, and I serve it, you'll be slapping everybody around you. <laughs>